This is More Than Before with Nathan Cook. Hey everyone, welcome to the show today. Uh, I'm really excited for our guest. He is an award-winning coach, amazing storyteller. He is the founder of LDR Leaders Develop Relationships. He is an adjunct faculty coach at the University of Denver. He's a pastor, military veteran, father, grandfather. The list keeps going on, but most of all, he is a really good friend of mine. Dennis LaRue, welcome to the show, brother. How are you doing today? Oh, Nathan, thanks for having me, man. Just listening to that list of titles, I, I felt like Apollo Creed in the Rocky movies as they were going through all the little nicknames that he had. <laughs> <laughs> it's because there's a certain point where you when you kind of like hey stop reading like you're making me sound too good it's only going to go down from here right? oh no so you have been a really great friend but we have we have worked together quite often actually in the past you know we we were doing facebook lives when that was a thing i don't know if you remember that we called oh, that uh, dna today dennis and nathan today uh and it, we actually had my daughter on at one point which became rna today which <laughs> <laughs> don't go searching for that it was not good it was not good you're never good the first time right <laughs> no kidding <laughs> oh my gosh but it it really has been a really cool journey uh you know when i first met you you were still serving uh in the military by the way thank you for your service um yes you know you were still serving in the military you've had a very extensive career from military to being uh an adjunct uh, faculty coach um to You've had such a broad range of of titles and positions. You know, you work with uh, business leaders in your community, uh, helping them develop their businesses. You've traveled around the world and actually um, helped different companies with transformational leadership and transformational principles, putting those into practice. I'm curious because someone that would look at your pedigree would say, oh, my gosh, like he's just kind of always been like doing all this stuff. Is that true? Like ever since you were a kid, were you kind of the guy that kind of did everything that you just got your hands involved and like, let's, let's get to work. As a kid, I wouldn't say that at all about me as a kid. There were aspects of leadership. If it was involved sports, then yes, that answer is correct. I was always that person on the sports team that was um, showing up, putting, putting the best on the field, doing the extra work. Um, Always about winning, encouraging my teammates, a good team player, setting the example. All of that on the on the sports field is true. Outside mm -hmm. of that, no, I would I didn't want to be involved in a lot of things. Like you know, I relied on my talent when it came to school and grades for the longest time. When I started forgetting my homework, well, then mom and dad got involved, and then I I didn't forget my stuff because I was getting in trouble. Were you always kind of the, the high achiever, high performer in life? Yes. At least in my mind, I was, I was always, uh, you know, my identity, my identity as a kid was winning. Like the teams mm. I was on was winning, winning championships, winning trophies, first place, winning the game. It, that was huge for me. being the best, being the fastest runner in class in elementary school, winning ribbons on, on a field day, being told that I'm the best at something, that was everything to me. And my dad said this to me the other day when I, I was up at his house. He said, he said, I have never seen a poorer sport and a poorer winner in all my life than you. <laughs> Yeah, he said. He said, "I've never met anybody who was a sore loser and an even sore winner." <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. What what kind of catapulted you into going into the military? Because uh, you know it, it's interesting nowadays. Because I don't I don't hear too many kids who are talking about wanting to go into the military. It, you know, the, it, it's it's a different view that we have on military, which I think is unfortunate because uh, I love our military members, um, whether active or who are reserves or who are retired. Uh, there's such a great need for service members. I'm curious for you, what was the calling for you? What, what made you go into the military? In high school, I was like some of the folks here today. I, I had an army recruiter that wouldn't leave me alone in high school. So I, I didn't know anything about sales, but here's what I knew. I'm going to ask mom and dad if I can invite him to the house. And <laughs> I knew that they would agree. 
got him to the house. He gave me his pitch. I don't remember anything he said other than maybe GI Bill and, and a dollar amount. At the end, I said, I'm not interested. And I knew that when I said that in front of my parents, one, now they were probably a little disappointed. But two, I knew that that, that recruiter would leave me alone. And he did. He bothered my sister for a little while after that. But now fast forward a few years ahead. I've got a I've got a year of college under my belt. I'm at a junior college for a year and a half. The, the year of college is another story. I met my wife. We're married. Daughter on the way. I'm working at a grocery store full time, night shift, stocking shelves. At this point, I'm also thinking through things. I'm, I'm at that point. I'd had a huge transformation in my life and in, in my faith, where I discovered it. So all this is going on, and and one day my wife and I were driving home from. Uh, I'm not sure where we were driving home from, but we were driving by our favorite dating place, the Dollar Theater. <laughs> That's about all we can afford, uh, you know, Dollar Theater. And in in the same area, right next door to the Dollar Theater were the, was the recruiting station, all four offices there at the time, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. And she said, we should go check that out. What about the military? I'm like, oh, I don't know. But my, but my instant shift was, well, hold on, wait a minute. What about the possibility? Okay, mm. I got my pregnant wife. Let's do this. Let's check this out tomorrow because our schedule, my our schedule's better. But you're coming with me. I would not be a good poker player because I'm going to show you all my cards up front. I'm going to let you know you're you're going to lose the hand or win the hand. In this case, I was bringing her in as a hey, look, I'm not signing any paperwork today, and she's my backup to help me because if she does agree with this, I'm signing nothing. And so the next day comes, and it's the Air Force recruiter. And the and the Marine recruiter were the only ones open that day. The Army and Navy weren't there. And I said to her before that, I'm only going to consider the two offices open that day. I don't know why I said that, but that's just what happened. So spent an hour and a half with the Air Force recruiter. He told us everything that we needed to know based off of the questions we asked. He didn't volunteer any additional information. And the Marine recruiter we went to church with. And you know what? Mm. He pushed me and, and he pushed me out the door in less than five minutes saying, I don't have anything for you. I could have been a hot candidate, all ready to go. He didn't. He said, I ain't got nothing for you. He pushed me out the door. So at that point, it was the Air Force. And after talking to family members who had been in the military, talking to parents, praying over it together, uh, the decision was, OK, Air Force is it. If we're going in, it's the Air Force. And that. That led into, okay, here we go, basic training. And the the hardest part of that was going to basic training and before my daughter was born. She wasn't born until Mm -hmm. two weeks into basic training. So you factor in the toughest, you know, all the stress of going in. The first two weeks of basic training were stressful because I'm adjusting to a whole new way of life, yelled at all the time, new things. You know, it was just. You know, John tells us it doesn't matter how deep it is if the water's over your head, right? Well, yep. the water was over my head, and I'm sinking. And on top of that, I'm I'm stressed out because I've got a wife at home who hasn't delivered our baby yet, and I'm just and we didn't know at that time if it was a boy, if she was a boy or a girl, or who it was going to be. And so I'm stressed. I literally lost my voice. In those mm. two weeks, I prayed every day, Lord, just give me enough vocal that they hear me and on top of that they hear me in such a way that they don't pick me out to pick on me so i don't stand out the wrong way what do you think from your past uh helped you the most through basic training right you know there's there's kind of a mental piece that is really required to go through that you know there's some physicality obviously uh, but for you, what helped you in your life up until that point before going in to the recruiter, before enlisting, what up until that point in your life helped you to be able to meet the challenge of going through basic, of actually enlisting? Mm, that's a good question. You know, two things jump out right away. The first thing is, is I played sports year round. 
So I was very, I mean, I made practices, I made games. I didn't miss practices or games unless I, I, either I was sick or my parents had vacation and I couldn't, and I had to go and I couldn't stay home. So I, I was very disciplined and constantly uh, physically ready. So phys and being an athlete, even as a kid, there's a, there's a mental aspect to it. And so I knew from a military standpoint, physically, that I was not going to have any problems. I mean, I was a mm. runner. I was running 10 miles for fun. I was running 10 miles to go to the mall to go see my wife while she was working and come home with, with hardly breaking a sweat. That's just, I, I loved running. Um, mm. I used to uh, run everywhere. I was like Forrest Gump before there was a Forrest Gump when it comes to running. But literally, that's that's how I was. So that helped me a ton. And But what really helped me going into basic training was actually having the conversation with my father-in-law. He passed away a couple of years ago, a Marine. And I asked him, tell me about your basic training when you were in Vietnam, going to Vietnam. He told me everything. Here's what I know. The Marines are the baddest of the bad. They let you know that. All the other branches of the service, whether we like it or not, we always say that. We always look up to those guys because of their camaraderie and who they are. Um, so when he told me all about his basic training, I mentally prepared myself for Marine Corps basic training. I knew physically I was ready for any basic training. And so going in, I knew that anything below that, it, I should be okay. Was it still stressful? Yes. But it wasn't near as stressful as trying to go through Marine boot camp. Mm. So those two things really helped me. And also just my my knowing that from praying through this and having that confidence that this is the direction I'm supposed to go, it's not going to be easy. But you know what? This is where you're supposed to be. Learn the lessons. Be present. Just do that little bit that's in front of you today. Practice, practice, practice. So just the the discipline that I picked up from being a athlete, the mental training I got briefly from my father-in-law, and also that this was, was to take care of my family first and foremost. That was my number one reason for joining was, you know, I got I got a family to provide for, and this has got educational benefits. It's got health care for them. And I'm getting skills. I'm serving my country. I'm, I'm kind of getting the whole bag here. So let's mm. make the best of it. And then let's see what happens from there. My intention wasn't even to stay and retire. My intention was four, eight years tops. Wow. That's crazy. You know, I've always admired your discernment within different circumstances and different situations. You always have a very good, clear way forward. And even when you don't, you're really good about asking questions. And I think it kind of comes from that. You're, you've mm -hmm. always been, as I've known you, a very quizzical person. You, you're always seeking information. You're always asking other people who are around you. You know, that, that statement of if you're the smartest person in the class, then you're in the wrong class. Mm -hmm. Well, you are definitely uh, on the smarter side of the class, I would say. But that's because you ask so many questions and you have for a long time. Was that trait of being quizzical, of asking questions, of being curious, was that always something that you had growing up or was that something that you developed later on in life? I, I think it's always been there and here's why. I've always loved reading. I can't mm. remember a time that I didn't love to read. And mom and dad always had books for us. We had all kinds of books, dictionaries, encyclopedias. For those of you that are watching this, it was Wikipedia in a book format, okay? It's Google <laughs> in AI in book format that I had to read. So I had those, and I had books, and I've always bought books. And so I just, I was always devouring books. I can remember in first grade going into the sixth grade section of the library and checking out books. And taking them home and reading them and, and looking at them. And I was always wanting to, to grow in that way. And I just loved reading. So I think a lot of my questions were here, developed from the books that I read. And I would ask mom and dad from time to time. But mom and dad, you know, I grew up in the 80s, late 70s and 80s. And so 
moms and dads were normally working. And so there wasn't a lot of opportunity to ask them questions on things. And that that's not a knock on my parents. I love my parents and they worked hard, but it was a different time. I was always reading books. And if I had homework or asked questions, I would ask them and they would help me with it as, as much as they could. Hmm. But a lot of it was learning it on my own and finding the ways to do that and then just just doing it. Now, I, I was a one that would raise my hand in class a lot, but I got to the point where I was reading and learning. I didn't ask a lot of questions because I'd already read the books and I kind of had some of the answers already. So I got bored hmm. in class. And when I got bored, I got lazy. When I got lazy, I started goofing off and started becoming the class clown. Hmm. Interesting. I love that questions and that curiosity and that love and desire for learning. Reading books has always been something that's been there for you mm -hmm. because I think it truly has opened up doors for you. What are some of those larger doors that have been opened up just by you being willing to ask the question or by seeking out information? What doors have been opened up to you by merely asking questions? A couple of doors have opened up by uh, asking questions. The first door that came to mind when you asked that question was in my military career. Now, I was enlisted. There's an officer enlisted. Officers are like your generals and your colonels. I was enlisted. And I was involved in a process that, that involved the presidential budget cycle for the Air Force. And we had a new colonel in our organization. I came to his office to brief him because on the next day he was going to be a part of that process where they were prioritizing mission and getting the strategic budget submission together. So I came in to do the pre-brief for him for, for the next day. And he said, he said, hold on a second. As he's listening to me talk, he's like, hold on. He gets on the phone. He calls the, the, uh, the person running point for that session tomorrow, who happened to be a friend of mine. And he said, Hey, can I send Sergeant LaRue in my place tomorrow? And they're like, Sergeant LaRue, are you sure? Yeah. He goes, yeah, you can send Sergeant LaRue on, in your place tomorrow. I'm like, okay. So the next day I'm in this room. One, I got a brief and initiative from another base I was in to defend why it should be in the list. But And that was from years before. Now I'm sitting at the table with generals and colonels and high-ranking civilians equal to them it, prioritizing mission that goes into the presidential budget. I should have been setting up the room, clicking next slide and getting the coffee based off of my rank <laughs> in that room. The information and being able to pr present it to my, my leadership, it opened the door for me to be in a room that I shouldn't have been in based off of mm. my rank. So that's one from good questions. Another one that opened up, wow, there's a couple. I've got to meet some really cool, amazing people uh, over the last few years. I got to meet uh, the San Antonio Spurs head coach, Greg Popovich, just recently elected to the NBA Hall of Fame. And I got to be mm -hmm. in that room because um, I built a relationship with an individual who gave me an opportunity to come to a very special event in, in the Spurs. Uh, stadium. It's been renamed. At the time, it was the AT&T Center. Well, Coach Popovich was an Air Force Academy graduate and served in the Air Force for a short time. And I know that. A lot of people do being here in San Antonio. Well, knowing that, I had the chance to ask him a question. Everybody else, this was an opportunity. It was a private Q&A with Greg Popovich. <laughs> now, most people know Coach Popovich as being kind of grumpy with having to answer questions during basketball games, which is true. And he explained why in this event. But, you know, there, here are these people in this private one-on-one -on -one opportunity. There were literally only 20 people. And they got a chance to ask a Hall of Fame head coach one of the greatest of all time questions. And some of the questions that were asked were, you could tell by his response, it was a waste of his time. And so mm. as I listened to him talk, I got to ask him this question. I said, Coach, you've been talking this whole time about how you develop the players and create opportunities and help them to grow. What do you do to grow yourself in the offseason? How do you develop you? 
how do, who coaches you coach? Man, he gave me a 10 minute answer. He gave me all kinds of things that he does and how he does it and what he does. And it was just a, such a great, I got my notes from it and I still have it. And then as we were, as he was walking off when he finished, I mean, no, he didn't give anybody else that long of an answer. And so when we finished, he's walking off and I just said, coach, I'm, I'm retired Air Force. He said, really? And so we, we played the, what was your, what was your job in the Air Force and all that? And then he, I got a picture with him and that mm. was so awesome. And so that was one. And then another question was, I got to spend time with a uh, Notre Dame head football coach, retired uh, coach Lou Holtz. And that was a question of asking John Maxwell, Hey, I really love Coach Lou. His books have I've, I've followed him since I was a kid, and I love the way he coaches and how you know John has mentioned how important um, uh, Coach Wooden is to him. And I mentioned that's how Coach Lou Holtz is to me. I said, "How do I connect with him, John? I know he's a friend of yours. I'm not asking for any special help. How do I connect with him?" And he told me. He gave me one short answer. And that one short answer gave me the opportunity to to send Coach Lou a little note, and I just asked him for the opportunity to to speak with him. If it ever uh, I found his address, and I just asked if the opportunity ever presents itself, I would love to have ten minutes and a cup of coffee with you and ask you a few questions. Hmm. And I got that opportunity. I, I got to have some. I got to have a private one hour session with Coach Lou, and it was just amazing. Wow! Just got so much out of that event. And if I'm not mistaken, you didn't get the meeting right away. It, like it was rescheduled, if I remember, because yes. there were a bunch of things that were happening around the time, and it, it, there was a moment where you were like, "Man, maybe this is it actually isn't going to happen. Maybe I'm not going to get an opportunity to actually get to interview this, you know, childhood hero of yours." How important is it to have the patience? for situations to evolve, for them to grow. Because we live in such a fast-paced world right now where people mm -hmm. saying go, do, push things to move faster, even when you're not ready. There are times where maybe you need to move forward, but there are also other times where you need to learn to pause and you need to wait for things to develop. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, this was one of those moments. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that, of the importance of waiting and the importance of um, being patient through circumstances for them to fully develop. In that specific situation, you know, Coach Lou Holtz is a uh, is a public speaker. He speaks all over the U.S. At least he's got a heavy schedule. On top of that, he's you know he's a he's a grandfather and has kids and family and everything else. So he he's very disciplined and meticulous with his time. The time frame I was going to be there just didn't work out for him. And he said so. And that, that's okay. And being patient with that was, the for me, just the fact that he said, if we can do it, let's do it, was enough for me. I, I'd wait as long as it took for that to happen because I really yeah. wanted to see him. How badly do you want this thing? Well, then you're going to be patient if patience required. If you don't want it, well, then you're going to be impatient and try to force it and you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it and the opportunity, and it may not come around again. And so I was willing to be patient, just say, you know what, in this case, it's 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 a timing. It's not me. It's not him. It's just a timing situation. So when it did happen, oh, I was it was it was better than expected. It was it was just mm. incredible. Some of us, you know, we're in this personal growth, and we're told to get out of our comfort zone. If we're push, if we are impatient pushing on something, you're no longer, it's not your, you're out of your comfort zone, but I think you're also out of your, you're, you're trying to push it, your will to make it done. And sometimes mm. that doesn't happen. For those of you that are maybe new to growth or maybe you've been uh, growing for a long time, we, we always talk about how growth is important, that we should all be growing, we should all be developing ourselves. And what do we what do we hear? You know, uh, the only time that you're ever growing is when you're outside of your comfort zone. You're yeah. in the uncomfortable zone, right? But it, you can't just be pushing and pushing and pushing so far out that you leave 
the uncomfortable zone, the discomfort, and you go straight into the pain zone, the danger zone, yeah. right? Highway to the danger <laughs> zone. That's what comes to mind to me. Because so many people are wanting to grow. They want to they want to become better. They want to develop themselves. They want to develop the skills. They want to hone some of the skills that they have. But sometimes we bite off way too much. We jump way too fast. We start barely towards a corner where we're going to have to make a sharp turn. And we're not going to be able to make that sharp turn mm -hmm. because we're out of control. We're no longer in the control of being in the uncomfortable situations, that stretching zone. Yep. Uh, you know, we, we know about the rubber band, right? You know, if you, if you stretch a rubber band, it becomes useful. But if you continue to stretch that rubber band, all of a sudden it breaks. And once it breaks, you can't put it back together. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are finding that nowadays we, you know, we have so many people that are experiencing burnout, they're having depression, they're having all kinds of, uh, problems in life. And, it, and we're not even just talking about people who are on the later years of their life. We're talking about kids in school that are yeah. so overwhelmed with everything going on because we keep putting things on their plate that rubber bands are snapping left and right. And so I like what you say about that. It's yeah, you do have to be in that growth zone, but you don't want to push it so far out. You don't want to push it to the part where you're actually in the danger zone of your life. You are in an interesting stage of life where not only are you working your own coaching and speaking career and job, you're also working at the University of Denver, and you also have your grandkids now that are in your life. And I know that they mean yeah, so much to you. might hear them in the background too. <laughs> might hear them in the background. But yeah. I'm, I'm curious, how important is it for you to show up consistently as the same person in each one of these uh, different aspects of your life? Because growing up, uh, at least I was taught and what I – what. And when I say taught, I don't think my parents taught me this, but it was something that I learned from culture that you have to change who you are in every single circumstance if you want to be successful. And I think it's actually the opposite, is that you need to stand out in every single circumstance because of who you are and who you were created to be. How is that alignment important to you today as you're juggling these three different roles as the same man? You know, it, it it is difficult in some cases, like right now, but uh, my granddaughter has big feelings. And when she doesn't get her way in some things, she's five, but she just, she gets fired up. The struggle with showing up in all of those areas, it happened today. I was in a meeting. My uh, three-year-old granddaughter came home. She came home from pre-K. She couldn't wait. She runs up the stairs. She tells her granny. Hey, I want to go see Pops. So well, Pops is in a meeting. She said, "Oh, that's okay. He'll let me in because I do." She knock. She knocks on the door. She comes in. She comes to the chair. Hi, Pops. So good to see you. I give her a big hug, kiss on the forehead, and I'll say, "I'm on a meeting right now," and she'll go right out the door. But I mm. want to let let her know. I may have not done that with my kids, and I realize I need to be. So there's growth for me. I'm going to do that for my grandkids. Mm. Let them know they're so important. As much as I love the people I'm serving in business and the the people I'm teaching, my students, because when when she they they sometimes come in during that class too, and I, I let my students know that. I, and a lot of them are working parents too, so I want to let them know from a consistency that I I value my family, and they're very important to me. And without them, all of this stuff doesn't even happen anyway. If I if I'm not doing well here, then it messes up everything else elsewhere anyway. So I want my grandkids to know that they're valued no matter what. And that shows up in my work. It shows up in in school and serving in that capacity. And so that's one way I try to stay consistent there. And mm. and it's tough. Because that one part of you is like, you're interrupting. I'm in the middle of a lesson and it's a, you're a distraction. But I don't ever want them to feel like they're a distraction. I, I, heard, I heard this from a, guy, from a guy by the name of Colin Sewell. He said, people are not an interruption to your day. 
they're the reason for it. Mm. And so I want my Man, grandkids that is so to know, good. isn't that a great quote? I heard that and I'm, and I know him and I said to him, Colin, this is so good. I'm keeping this. I use it all the time because that's how we can be consistent rather than get frustrated at work at, at what's going on at work or frustrated over here with this person or, Hey, even, even road rage. If I understand that <laughs> yeah. the reason for my day, that, that the people that are, I come across each day, they're the reason for my day. It helps me be consistent, show up consistently at, at every part of my day. And it gives you opportunities. We see the small little setbacks of life. We don't want to ever convey that, you know, our, our children or our grandchildren are coming in and they're setbacks. But those small unexpected things that happen in our day are actually mm -hmm. opportunities for us to grow and for us to really reveal what's in our heart, what's going on. Because I, I think so quickly we kind of have that knee jerk reaction. Oh, well, you know, I'm on a call. Like you got to get out of here or be quiet. Like, don't you know what's going on? It's so easy for us to knee jerk and have a reaction that if we were to stop and pause long enough to say, Oh, what, what is that? Hmm. Um, what is most important in this moment? And I love yes. that for as long as I've known you, you are such a big proponent, a, a big person when it comes to, reflection. Reflection is a huge part of your life. You talk about reflection a lot whenever I've met with you. There's a lot of importance when it comes to reflection. A lot of people don't understand why reflection is so important. How has reflection come across in your life in, in the way of how does that benefit you from having those reflective moments? Because we are moving so quickly, right? It's hard to slow down. Mm -hmm. And while we feel like I need to keep going, I need to have that one more meeting, I need to watch that last little bit of that show that I've been trying to finish for a long time, I need to finish that book, I need to call that person, I need to write that email. How important is the reflective piece in your day? What does that do for someone who is kind of like, man, I don't think I should spend that time reflecting. I don't think it's really going to be a beneficial thing. It, it feels like one of those soft woo-woo things. What, what would you say to that person <laughs> that doesn't spend time reflecting? Uh, the first thing I would tell them is look at your device. What's that battery up at the top look like? When it goes red, what happens? It goes dead pretty quick. We plug it in immediately when we see the red. Reflection is the charger that charges up that, mm. that, that phone. That charges the is the equivalent of the charger, but it's for you. And that pause in, in the day, it could be the start of the day. It could be the middle of the day. I do it throughout the day in different patches now. I've gotten to where I need to take moments to recharge my battery throughout the day. Well, just before I got on mm. here with you, I, I'm charged up to be with you. So I, it doesn't take much to, to get me, to get us together and charged up, right? But I oh, still... he had to go do run laps outside and, you know, <laughs> throw cold water on himself. And, you know, he probably, you know, had a bunch of hot sauce so he could be fired up and ready. Right. <laughs> you know, I, still, I got my I got my coffee with me. That's part of it. But I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you can call that a cup of coffee. That's like a bath of coffee. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it, it is. But over here in my chair, I sat in my chair for a couple of minutes and just reflected, reflected on the questions, reflected on what being present, being prepared, just thinking through the day and, and being present to let everything that happened up to this point of the day, just to let that go on the wayside so I could be present. And that's what reflection does. Reflection helps you be present in the moment. Reflection helps you learn the lessons from the past so you don't repeat them in the future. Reflection mm -hmm. helps you to Ask the questions you need to ask to get the answers you need. And for me, I, I started reflecting when I when I started growing my faith. That's when I started really the process of reflection. That's mm. when I started asking the questions. Okay, how do I grow? How do I grow in character? Because, you know, this we talk about personal growth. Character growth is not optional. Personal growth is optional. It's your choice. Character growth is not optional. You will not be successful in this life with horrible character. You may have a lot of money, but there's a lot of people with a lot of money 
that wish they had good character. Everybody's looking for happiness. Happiness is a choice, mm. and happiness goes back to character. So going through and growing character and asking those questions, well, what does this look like? How does this show up? Where is the opportunity to practice this? And being open to those things. And then when I mess up, reflect on it. What, what happened? What did I do wrong? Did I do anything wrong? Did, was it just not enough experience? Working through that process in, in different areas that if I never reflected, then we, you know, we keep getting what we always got because we keep doing what we've always done. And reflection mm. breaks that cycle and helps us yeah. to see, okay, let's be the, I love sports and I love sports broadcasters. But be the own sports broadcaster in your life and just look at what's going on in the field, but it's your field and it's your life and tell the story of what you're seeing. I love it because it, I like how you were you were talking about this because I think so many people think about reflection as a reactive tool. You have something happen in your life and re reflection is almost kind of like the... You know, we used to make fun of, uh, I, maybe you didn't. I, I remember making fun of, you know, sisters and girls. Oh, you have your diary. You have your little journal. You're going to go and write in your journal of what happened today. <laughs> but you know what's interesting about that? That mentality doesn't serve you. If, if I would have realized back then what I know now, that reflection actually doesn't help you to just recall the past. It helps you to prepare for the future. Reflection isn't just reactive. It's proactive. Mm -hmm. In fact, even, even when you were talking about sitting in your chair before you, you were coming on here, that, uh, that moment of actually having reflection prepared you for the end game, the end result of what you want to, what you wanted to accomplish when you, you came on the podcast. And I think that's really important for people to understand because reflection isn't just a reactive tool. Reflection is a tool that helps you to be proactive. It helps mm -hmm. you move forward. It helps you gain clarity. It helps you to stop making the same stupid mistakes over and over and over again. I'm guilty of forgetting to do reflections. You know, it's really easy to put it off. Well, you know, it's really not going to make that much of a difference. But I will tell you that when you put in the effort, when you actually have a consistent scheduled reflective time in your day, and I know that you have this, Dennis, mm -hmm. but if you put that time in every single day to have reflection, it really does change the way that you show up in your life. And when we change the way that we show up in life, we change the results of the people around us in our life. Dennis, you've uh, you've served on uh, uh, Maxwell Leadership Team for a really long time. You've invested a lot into being on Presence Advisory Council for a number of years. You've gone on mm -hmm. transformational country uh, trips where you, you've paid to go to countries to teach leadership principles, to transform entire countries. And I think what's interesting about this is that at the core most people who know John Maxwell, and if you don't know who John Maxwell is, John Maxwell is one of the foremost authorities on leadership. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's so amazing about John Maxwell is John Maxwell, deep down at his core, has character and his values have just been unshakable. Like he is a, he is a guy that you can count on to show up that he's not going to have something pop out of his closet and go, oh my gosh, we can't, we can't have him on the stage, right? Character and values are so important. And I think it really comes to him understanding who he is. How has that been for you? Uh, in your life, what is a characteristic of who you are that has helped guide you to this point in your life? Something that has kept you from going off the beaten path. What is one of those core values that you really live by and you have lived by for a long time? Not because you say, you know what? Um, uh, curiosity is one of my core values and I'm just going to be curious all the time. That's not, it's not how it works, right? You have to, uh, you have to identify, you have to understand you're born. There's a characteristic that naturally comes out throughout childhood. You see it throughout high school. You th see it throughout your younger years. And for most people, they don't even understand or realize it until their later years. Right. Mm. But it's cool in those later years that you can look back and go, wow, 
This is actually a core value. This shows up even when I'm not trying to have it show up. It still shows up. What's one of those core values for you that you operate your life by? Wow, that's a, that is a fantastic question. Um, gosh, the one that shows up the the most for me. There's a couple that come to mind, but the first one that comes to mind for me is excellence. Everything that I do, I want to do with excellence. Now, do I know, but my motive is to do that. One thing that comes to mind right away is my handwriting. I can remember in second grade, I remember this to this day, we're practicing our letters or writing words, and this is when they taught cursive, probably now hieroglyphics to some people, but writing in cursive. (laughs) And I'll never forget, the teacher's name was Dorothy Winder. And she said to me, Denny LaRue, you have excellent penmanship. And I've always remembered that, and I've always tried to write that way all the time. Still to this day, I've always valued excellence there. And in sports, teams that I watch, excellence. It's not that I'm critiquing everybody else, but I just value, I value mastery. Mm. And so there's there's certain things in my life when I make decisions, when I some of my decision making comes down to are they masters at what they do? If they're not, I tend to not follow them or I tend to not purchase certain things because I I just value it. I can't explain it other than that, that. I, people will call that in sports bandwagon fans. No, I'm not a bandwagon fan. I, I, my team, my team that I follow was an excellent team for years, and they are known for excellence. They are known for being number one in other things. But I love watching other teams. They'll say, "How can you like this team? Because they're your rival." Well, because they're they're masters. They're master, like Greg Popovich, coach of the Spurs. Well, you're not a Spurs fan. I like the Spurs, and I value excellence and mastery. And these guys do that. Tom Brady's another one. So mastery is so important. You know, when I see things like the Samurais or Bruce Lee, they were masters of their craft, and it just, that resonates with me to the point where, like, uh, people right now in football, everybody's all excited. It's football. It's preseason. It's training camp. I hate training camp, and I hate preseason. Why? Because it doesn't count in the standings. I I want the players on the field that make the team and move mm-hmm. the team forward towards the playoffs. To me, this is I like practice, and these guys and pros are masters at what they do. But I don't like to watch it. It frustrates me. Mm. High school football, I won't watch it. It frustrates me. Why? Well, they're high schoolers. They're not masters of their craft. They're becoming that way. But there's something about that mastery that just, that's always stuck out to me. Excellence and mastery. I've really loved that, the excellence and mastery piece, because it really is a rarity that we find it nowadays. There's so many people that are jumping from one thing to the next. You know, you know, everyone is quitting things nowadays. No one sticks around for anything. You've got people who leave their marriages left and right. Like, it's it's really difficult to find people that are persistent enough to want excellent, to want mastery in their life. And I love that because that truly is a quality about you, that when you show up, you truly do your best in every single circumstance. Now, your best may not be you know, to the level that other people might want it, but it is your best, right? And there's a right. difference between perfection and excellence. And so I really, I really, really love that about you. So Dennis, in terms of relationships, because mm-hmm. relationships are really important. Um, you know, I, I love that you said earlier that you came to a moment in your walk, your faith walk, that you really started to own it, that it wasn't yours up until a certain point in your life. I'm curious, what was life growing up for you um, in terms of your relationship with God? And what did that look like for you to come back to a place where it became established in your life, where it was no longer a practice and Mm -hmm. it became a relationship. I remember as a kid going to church a lot. Um, Mom and dad, mom took me to church. Dad didn't always go to church, but mom took us to church. 
And we went every weekend uh, for as long as I can remember. For several years, we went. Now, I went to church. It was like going to school. For me, it was a social gathering. I went to see my friends. Um, but there was always a spiritual side to me. It wasn't when I was there, I, I didn't, none of the stories stuck with me. You know, the sermon, I didn't, I wasn't paying attention to the, I was just there. And I remember at the age of about 10, I remember my mom saying, okay, you know, if you don't want to go to church anymore, you don't have to. And I'm, for me, being a sports fan, I'm like Sunday, I'm living in the Dallas Fort Worth area. I got the Dallas Cowboys football or go to church. Well, for a 10 year old, that's an easy decision. I'm going to stay home and watch football. And so, and yeah. that's what I did, sports. But there was still that spiritual side to me. But my our next door neighbors, uh, they're like second family to me. Their mom said to me, you know, she remembers one time we were playing in their little fort. We were playing church. Well, I got to be the preacher, and I'm preaching from a Bible. I don't know anything that I said. <laughs> I don't know what I read or said, but we were playing that. So that that's mm. always been a component of my life, and it wasn't until, um, even in high school, I wrote I wrote a paper one time in high school, based off of a magazine. It was a creative writing based off of a New Yorker cover magazine, and it was all spiritual. It was all about heaven and hell. And I can tell you, I went to how many times I went to church during high school, and it was for weddings or funerals. It, it wasn't necessarily mm. going to church. But yet that was a theme for me when I wrote this paper. So it's always showed up. And it wasn't until I, I met my wife and we were we were dating and, and I started going to church with her and I started listening. And I heard sports from the pulpit. That's when the first time it clicked. I heard the preacher say something about football in the pulpit. And I said, they talk about that here? What? In church? <laughs> no way. Let They're me see if he talk about things outside no, of the Bible, right? I couldn't believe it. <laughs> And I started growing and listening, and then my wife shared with me the gospel, and I responded because I knew she was the one. What my initial motive was, this is the person I'm supposed to spend the rest of my life with. If I'm not meeting up to what she needs, well, then I need to start asking some questions. And I remember going back to questions and introspection, pulled out my dusty mm -hmm. third grade gift Bible. I'm 21. I'm blowing the dust off of it. And I get by the bed and I'm like, all right, Lord, it's Dennis. We haven't talked in a while, but there's this girl and I really like her. And I think she's the one. And she, I don't know what this, you know, being born again or saved business is all about, but um, I want to know what it means. And it was over the course of months that led to that, that led to that moment where I realized, okay, you know what? I get it. I, Lord, now what's this relationship stuff all about? I, I, I don't want the get out of hell free card. It goes back to mastering excellence. I'm not here just to, because I, I, I'm in the cheap seats in the bleachers. I got free tickets from somebody and now I get to sit in the cheap seats. What do I got to do to get on the front row? What do I got to do? You want to get really, on the field. I want to get on the field. I want to grow. What is this all about? Thankfully, I had mentors early that were spending time with me and helping me understand the Bible, helping me to pray, te teaching me how, how to listen and grow. And, and just, it was consistency. I, I couldn't wait to read. I couldn't wait to study. And I knew that I was gifted to communicate and, and teach and so I immediately was thrown into, you know, teaching Sunday school to youth, being a part of a youth department. And a pastor said one time, said, you ought to, I want you to fill in the pulpit for me. I'm going to be going away. I want you to fill in. I'm 23 years old. And I'm, and now I'm, I'm giving my first sermon. And so this whole process of, of daily reading, and I love reading, so it didn't take me long to start filling up my library with books about growing spiritually. And so I just, it's been a learning process ever since. Every day I'm learning something new. Every day I'm growing. Every day I'm also going back to fundamentals like character development and, and reviewing, reviewing character areas. And, you know, where have I gone off the rails? And that's happened in my walk. It hasn't been easy. Read the Bible. David had his mistakes, and and all of these others made. When we read it, we're like, "Oh my gosh!" And yeah, I've had my "Oh my gosh" moments too. 
but it, it always just comes back to, okay, but I'm, I'm growing. I'm pulling out the weeds every day. I'm pulling out the rocks out of the garden. I'm, I'm learning now to shift from constant introspection to how do I give this away? How do I walk this out? How do I, ju- how do I spread? My two favorite terms are salt and light. Because how do I give, how do I radiate that image that's in me? But how do I make others want that image in to show up in them too? And that's where the salt comes mm. in. Dennis, I have one more question here for you before we wrap up. Um, you know, first of all, though, uh, I, I do want to make sure, you know, if you like what you're hearing today, uh, make sure you follow Dennis. Um, find him on social media, but uh, you can also reach out to him. Dennis, what's a, what's a good way for people to find you? A great way to find me is actually, I want you to go to my LinkedIn page, Dennis Lure Jr., My page will pop up, and on my page, there is a Calendly link available to you, and click on it. It's a 45-minute conversation that we have, complimentary. It's just to get to know you. I call it a virtual coffee. Let's have a virtual coffee together and get to know one another that way, because it's about relationship. So you can follow me on LinkedIn. You can follow me on Facebook, too. But to really, if you want to spend time in a conversation, let's do that right there, because that's how I would love to support and get to know you relationally and and serve you in whatever capacity I can. You are such a great coach because you are good at listening. You are great at asking questions even more so. Um, and you truly are a wealth of knowledge and have so much wisdom. I really appreciate you being on the show today. You know, I, I want to finish off by asking you one more question. This one goes a little bit more deep. We talk about, uh, I like to talk a lot about uh, on the podcast about how it's really important to understand that being is more important than doing. Mm-hmm. We really focus a lot on being in our life. You know, it's all about achievements, all about awards, it's all about money. It's all about, there's a lot of those things that are out there and it's good, right? It's good to be excellent. It's good to be master of your skill. It's good to make money. It's, these are all good things, mm-hmm. but it's not worth losing a part of yourself to go after them, losing a part of your identity. You have a really long, great career, and right now you have some grandbabies, some grandkids that are around you consistently and often. What is that core value, that character piece that's inside of you that you would love to see instilled in your grandkids that they would move forward with and that they would pass that on to their kids? What's, what's, a, what's a core value piece that you hope by the way that you live your life, by the way that you show up, that your grandkids will move forward in their life carrying that same legacy? Mm, That is so good. What a great question. There's so many values that come to mind, but I think the, the value that comes the most with them is being available. I've got a picture. It's one of my favorite pictures of when they were it, they were even smaller. So they're five and three right now. They were probably one and three. And they're on the floor like this. And I'm on the floor like this with them. And they are staring at me as I'm like trying, telling them a story. And they are engaged. And the reason I love that so much is, is not only my present, but I'm at their level and I'm getting down on the floor with them and I'm play and I'm playing games with them. And, and on the way to school now, we, we pretend we're in a pirate ship and we're hiding lost treasure at the school. And we're constantly in this land of make believe, so to speak, because that's where they are. And so I, I want to meet them where they are. I wish I'd have done this more with my kids. I don't know that I did this enough with my kids. But I'm it, it. Grandkids are a way to kind of break that that the things you wish you'd have done. And so the one thing I want them to do for their kids is I want them to be available and present and invest quality time, quality moments, not time, but when they are there, they're present in the moment and they're understood. Because kids, that's all they want. That I noticed, kids just want you to be available and present, and 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 play with them for a little bit. It could be five minutes, ten mm-hmm. minutes, a half an hour, 
those are the moments in their memories that that last and those are the things that they remember and then those are the things that they bring to the the generation that they bring up it's those positive memories and moments with family or friends or whatever that they that they carry on and mm. rather than all the negative stuff if i can if if i can create enough positive memories in their life positive moments in their life as, as their grandfather as as their pops that when when they grow up and and have their families they will be doing the exact same thing that their granny and pops did with them that were positive and helpful and passing that along and have great mm. memories and that's i think that's where we as a, all generations we focus so much on all the stuff that we did wrong in the previous generation and we wonder why the next generation is the way it is. Well, we all we did was focus on the wrongs. How about we focus on some of the rights and pass those along and reinforce those? And let's catch people. I tell this to my students all the time in my class. Catch your employees doing something right. Catch them doing something mm. right and tell them what they did was right and let them know they did it right. And even let them know in front of a group of their peers that you saw that and it was right and great. And I promise you it will make a difference in the culture of your team. It'll make a difference in that person's life. And I promise you they'll never forget it because we don't do it enough. You could not end on a better note right there. Uh, brother, I want to thank you so much for being here today. I know so many people that are listening to this, that are watching this, um, they've been poured into today because of what you shared. They've been encouraged. Um, they've been pushed, ready to go to do some active reflection uh, so that they can prepare for what's coming up next. Make sure you listen to this again and again. Share it with a friend in your life that needs to hear what Dennis had to say. And I also want to encourage you, make sure to subscribe to the podcast, share, like it. It really does actually help the show. Thank you again, Dennis, for being on the show. We'll see you guys next time. And remember, be more, see more, experience more together.